Do y'all remember David Zoll? He came here to St. James's to speak right before the pandemic shut down um, in-person meetings to talk about his book, Seculosity. David is a theologian who works at Christ Episcopal Church in Charlottesville just down the road, and he's keen on looking for where God's grace is or is not in the world around us, often reflecting on pop culture and American culture. If you haven't checked out the blog he oversees, Mockingbird, or its podcast, The Mockingcast, I highly recommend it. In this book, though, that he came to talk to us about, he coined a new word, seculosity, by merging the word secular with the word religiosity to name the habit we humans have of looking for religion, systems of salvation and justification just about anywhere. <laughs> and he named them in particular in more secular activities we have, like our parenting techniques or exercise, wellness, dieting fads, even searching for the one. So David explored in this book how we look for these ways to mark ourselves as saved in activities other than cl the classic capital R religions like Christianity, Judaism, Buddh Buddhism, Hinduism. Now, he doesn't knock the desire to seek the best for ourselves. Let's be clear about that. He's very much like, I adhere to some of these lowercase r religions too. Um, but he does observe how often we use these systems to mark who's in and who's out, who belongs and who doesn't belong, who is better, nay, saved, because I use an iPhone and you use an Android. His book is really fun. He's got a great sense of humor, and it's insightful. In part, I think, because he observes in our modern fads and habits what is really a very classic phenomenon of human social behavior. We see this in our epistle today, in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Now, Corinth was a center for trade in the Mediterranean. It was a Greek community and society. Being a center of trade, as you can imagine, that meant that there were different people from all over the known world. Greeks, Romans, Galois, the North Africans, Nubians, Egyptians, folks from all over. Well, despite the fact that the Corinthian church had come together around the gospel, joining together across boundaries and languages and divides of all kinds, the church community at Corinth was divided along a few lines. And most of Paul's letter to the Corinthians is about instructing them so they can resolve these divides, so that they can experience and be Christ's one body. So Paul addressed each of these in turn. The economic one is probably the easiest for us to pick up on. Paul wrote, I think it's in chapter 8, I hear some of you have been eating your fill while others go hungry at your potlucks. You know, Greek potlucks, they had those too. And the social one, well, takes a little bit more unpacking, the social divide. In order to understand the social divide in Paul's letter, you have to understand what was highly valued in Greek society, and that was wisdom and knowledge. You know, Greek philosophers, Socrates, Plato, etc. Well, in the Greek world, wisdom and knowledge made you great in the eyes of all. And so the Corinthians, too, held wisdom and knowledge, education as the thing that made one person better than another. Moreover, particular to the Corinthian church, they were valuing a particular gift or two, one or two above others, as marking who was better at being Christian. This kind of zealousness is common to new con converts to activities of all kinds, whether it's a sport or a religion. But it has a particular strain in religious communities. 
where we they latch on to external markers of piety, like morality or the right way to pray. In the Corinthians case, they had chosen the gift of tongues as being a signifier of who was holier than thou. If you could speak in tongues, surely the Holy Spirit had chosen you to be special, better than those other Christians. It didn't matter that no one else could understand you. <laughs> but some members were saying that the gift of tongues was a marker that God valued you more than others, and they were puffing themselves up over it. That's kind of the phrase that they use, puffing themselves up. I love that, like a puffer fish. Puff. <laughs> Hannah Gadsby fans out there, anybody? Puff. Well, Paul was a master of rhetoric, y'all, Greek and otherwise, and he knew that the Corinthians thought they were smarter than him. So Paul opens this section really brilliantly, teasing them, saying, now, I don't want you to be uninformed. So he's like, poke, poke, a little bit. And then he goes on to list all these spiritual gifts, you know, off the top of his head, choosing the gifts that the Corinthians value more, mixing them in with gifts they don't value as much. And so we get that big, long list of gifts because he knew as well as we do, that as long as they were valuing some people more than others and some gifts more than others, as long as a gift was for show and for puffing oneself up instead of for building up the community, they ironically didn't understand the spiritual things of the church. You see, Paul's point is that all the gifts come from the one Spirit. So all the gifts are valued, and all the people are valued. Each person brings a gift that is needed by the community. And moreover, every person is a gift needed by the community. Fight it. Disagree with it. This is our reality. In the very next paragraph, which we don't get today, so I encourage you to go home and read it. In the very next paragraph, Paul brings this all home with a groundbreaking vision of the church and for the church, that we are one body, Christ's body. But why use words when we can sing about it? This is the Children's Chapel all-time top hit, and I'm going to invite you all to join with me and the choir in singing it. So, Dr. W. We are one. We are one. One body. One body. All of us. All of us. One body. One body. God has made. God has made. Christ's body, we all belong. Amen. <laughs>